Greetings to you. My name is Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 122. That is the PhD by prior publication. And this vlog is being recorded in a hotel room in the Lake District very early in the morning. And can I say it feels really like I'm on a Betty Davis film set. It is very, very odd, but also sort of very funny as well. So I thought let's just record something here amongst the beige. Let's do this. But this vlog today is exciting and it comes via request from the wonderful Randall, one of our students, PhD students at Flinders, who's had an incredibly distinguished career and has enrolled at Flinders University to partake of a PhD by prior publication. So I'm really thrilled to deliver this vlog and I know that Randall and his wonderful wife in Auckland uh, watch these vlogs every single Friday. So my respects to you both, Kia ora and Randall. We are so thrilled and so privileged to have you as part of this program. And let me tell you how we got here. Randall and I exchanged emails before he came and visited us at the Office of Graduate Research. But Randall and I exchanged emails and we were chatting and I was having a great time with him. And he said to me, you know, Tara, when I enrolled in the PhD by prior publication, I thought it would be really easy, like just slam together some articles, write an introduction and boom, we're good to go. But it's actually much more complicated than that. So could you record a vlog on that issue? Well, I'm absolutely thrilled to do so and Randall I was always going to record a vlog on the PhD by prior publication just like I did last week to record a vlog on the creative led artifact exegesis PhD but I probably had to get the vlogs into the hundreds to do so because these are a minoritarian mode of enrollment incredibly important incredibly challenging uh, to enrol in, to do and be examined. So it is very important that we talk about some tips and some options to make it an easier progress. But I was also very aware that it is a small part of what we do in a PhD program. But having said that, it's an expanding area of a PhD program. What we're gonna talk about today is getting bigger every single year. More and more students from a diversity of disciplines are enrolling in this mode. So it is timely and Randall, thank you for being you and thank you for this suggestion. So let's do this. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about how the PhD by prior publication was configured, when, where and why, what were those originating methods and then how it's changed in our present and what it actually is and how to do it. So I'm going to be very prescriptive today. You can ignore me and argue with me. I love it when you do that, but I will be prescriptive because it's it's not paint by numbers, but there is a way to structure the PhD by prior publication that makes a real difference, I think, when it is examined. So the PhD by prior publication had its origins in the United Kingdom in the late 80s, the early 1990s. So what happened was the former polytechnics became universities. So this was a key period of movement in terms of quality assurance from the polytechnic sector to what they called the new universities. So best example is, of course, the Manchester Poly. The Manchester Polytechnic became, through the 1992 protocol, the Manchester Metropolitan University. Now this was an industry-wide movement that required industry-wide policy transformations with a lot of attention to quality assurance. So the CNAA, the Council of National Academic Awards, was involved in ensuring this movement would be rigorous, it had governance, it had policy, it had procedure, and most importantly, of course, quality assurance was guaranteed. So that a degree done at a new university is equivalent to a degree done at an older university. You can't just wish and hope that happens, that's about governance. But one of the challenges in this movement from the polys to the new universities was the credentialing, the qualifications of staff. So you had very, very experienced staff who had been teaching 10, 20, 30 years, had a distinguished research career as well, but had never done a PhD. 
And we need to remember the times too, late 80s, early 1990s. PhDs were not as popular, were not as available as they are today. So it was a rarer qualification. So in the polys, they tended to not have a PhD. So part of the movements of the CNAA was to find strategies to credential the staff with a doctorate. So as you can see, the PhD was involved in this quality assurance vibe. And therefore the PhD by prior publication occurred so that these staff at the former polytechnics could bind up their publications, whack in an intro and an outro, thanks for playing, and that would be equivalent to a PhD, a PhD by prior publication. This was highly controversial at the time. Of course, I have an insider's view of this because Steve was on the CNA and he was very much against this movement. He died still very much against this movement. Uh, and a lot of people at the time rendered this an incredibly controversial move. So the committee was basically trying to assess if a collection of publications is equivalent to 100,000 words of a traditional three-year generated PhD. So the questions were, of course, what number of articles would be equivalent to a traditional PhD? How would the issue of authorship and co-authorship be handled? And this is the tough one. How can originality be proven from an article that was written 10, 15, 20 years ago? How is that original? Remembering that the definition of a PhD is an original contribution to knowledge. So how could this mode of doctorate be equivalent to a hundred thousand words? Remembering that refereed articles have different aims, outcomes, audiences and protocols to an examined PhD. They are different entities. So this was a crunchy moment in the quality assurance protocol of the sector. So here we are now, a quarter of a century later, and the PhD by prior publication is still in our suites of enrolments in the doctoral space. But you see, that original aim or goal has now dissipated. So this is where it gets interesting. We have more people enrolled in PhD programs around the world than we ever have at any point in the history of higher education. So when a junior faculty post is advertised, if I can use the language from North America, or a junior lectureship post is advertised, we all know those of us who shortlist, over three quarters of the people that apply already have a PhD. These are for junior posts. And so the first cut we make, because there's so many people with a PhD, is we just cut the people without a PhD. So this is a different age, a different time. So the original aim of a PhD by prior publication was to move experienced staff into and through a doctoral program to create that culture of equivalence. But that original aim has now really gone, and yet the degree remains. And I've been watching it with a lot of fascination in the last couple of decades. And particularly in the last 10 years, some very interesting trends and tendencies are starting to emerge. So what we're seeing firstly, the first movement of which Randall is a part, are the inverted commas elite professions, so medicine and law they're starting to dominate the enrolment of the PhD by prior publication. So what this means is men and women have had outstanding professional careers in the law, in medicine, they have produced refereed articles throughout their career, very different in terms of disciplines, can I say, and they look at that suite of publications and think, hmm, that's my career, there's probably a PhD there. And you know what? They're right, a PhD by prior publication. And so Randall is part of that group. But recently I've been receiving some queries from a much wider group of people, particularly from the United States, and in what's called, I would argue, I would call this, we certainly called it in North America, but the applied social sciences. So people working in public policy, city imaging, transportation policy, regional development. So these people have got a fantastic public service career. They've written refereed articles up in public policy through that career. They're looking at these publications and saying, right, well, I wonder if there is a PhD there. And of course, 
Yes, there is a pretty straightforward one. All the publications are clustered. Again, thanks for playing. So this is really, I think, the moment of expansion again of the PhD by prior publication, of the baby boomers who are looking back on their career, seeing their referee publications and saying, right, well, as a capping moment, a capstone moment of my career, I will go for a PhD by prior publication. That's great. So there's that baby boomer audience then there's the Generation X audience, people of my generation who have had a very good career with lots of very good articles on the way through in public service, in the many international meanings of that phrase, and thinking, right, well, you know, these are clustered, I have something to say, there's originality there, and I'll go for a PhD by prior publication. So they're the two interesting groups, particularly law medicine and the applied social sciences. I'm sure it will expand to other areas as well. So that's setting the scene. As you can see, Randall's request was incredibly timely. So now that we've shown where it came from and where we sort of are now, let's now talk about it. What is it? What is the PhD by prior publication? So the PhD by prior publication has two parts. It has a body of work, that is the prior publications, like de, that's what it's called, the body of work. But there's also at the start, a contextual statement. Uh, it's often called an integrating essay too. So contextual statement at the start. So a damn big intro that provides the framework around the publications, the guide in and through the publications for the examiner. So what actually happens is the challenge is, the first challenge, let's just start at the beginning, keep it really, really clear, is the selection of publications. So what are you going to put in the body of work? Yeah. So if you've written eight publications and they're all clustered in a particular area, then thank you very much. Our business is concluded. <laughs> and you bundle it together with a contextual statement and we're good. We're golden. That's fine. But you've got to be lucky for that to have happened or indeed you've worked very solidly in a good slice of knowledge through your career. So all the publications are nested in a particular area of knowledge. And what your contextual statement does then is tell the story of the research, tell the stories of the publications. So that's one mode. But as with Randall, most people who are coming into this qualification have a hell of a lot of publications. I think, Randall, you have 174 refereed articles, was it, mate? So Randall, you know, the selection for Randall and his supervisors is um, quite challenging. So the first stage for the PhD by prior publication for colleagues like Randall is, right, here are these publications. I have to make a cut. What am I going to submit into the doctorate? Right, so how do you make that selection? Let me go through a process that may work for you. The first stage, I would argue, is that you've got to select the articles where you are the sole author or the first author. That is incredibly important. Now, I'm aware in some disciplines that doesn't apply. Maths is the archetypal example there. But remember, it must be your work that is assessed. So again, if you're the sole author, no worries, knock yourself out, thanks for playing. But in most disciplines outside of the humanities and theoretical social sciences, there is a co-authorship matter to address. Remember, just again, as I always try and do, think about it from the examiner's perspective. It is your responsibility to prove to the examiners that this is your work, the bulk of your work. And you're going to have to go in depth to show your contribution to that work. Now, we've seen problems where students are, and I'll use the technical phrase, scratching about a bit, where students are scratching about a bit to try and gather up enough articles to show a body of work. And so they end up putting in publications where they are the third author or the second author or the fifth author. And examiners have balked and refused the thesis and said, there is not enough work from the candidate here. So this is an area of major risk and risk mitigation in this mode of PhD. Right, so the first cut, the first selection is on authorship, protect yourself. Then the second cut is on the selection of 
content. Now let your supervisor help you with this one. So what we're after, uh, refereed articles, conference proceedings, book chapters, books that coalesce, that come together and tell a story of research. That is, when I supervise these theses, I always think about it like a jigsaw puzzle. I love them, actually. So we're piecing together bits and pieces of a refereed scholarship and refereed life to make, in, make it into a coherent picture. So I often get all the refereed articles, print them out, put them all over the floor of my lounge room, and start to look at how the jigsaw puzzle comes together. So this discovery led to this discovery, led to this discovery, led to this discovery, which became an original contribution to knowledge. So therefore, you need to select your articles and then you need to order them. Get them organised to tell the story of the research. Right, so your first job's done, right? So you've got your body of work, we're winning. Now let's get to the tough bit. The contextual statement or the integrating essay. I think both phrases help you understand what it actually is. So what this statement must do is demonstrate the capabilities of the candidate to conduct original research. Boom. So this is about significance and that significance and originality looks different in a PhD by prior publication to a traditional PhD. In many ways, and I'm being really honest here as I was doing the research for this vlog uh, this week, the candidate is being assessed a lot more in a PhD by prior publication than the publications in the conventional thesis, the writing and research in a conventional thesis. Because we're, we're looking at their, their body of work and the attention is on the candidate. There's no oral exam in the Australian system, so there is the focus on the research. But in this particular mode, you know, who are you? So I always say when I'm preparing my students to write the contextual statement, I give them the football chant one week, you know, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? And you do have to present who the hell you are. Who are you? What's this stuff? How has it come together and why should we care? That's the contextual statement. So for our newly emerging PhD by prior publication candidates that are coming from public policy and the applied social sciences, this significance and originality actually is a lot easier to prove because you can prove it. We'll get to how we prove significance shortly in this PhD by prior publication. But let's just focus on the really hard bit which is the hardest bit in the PhD by prior publication, is proving an original contribution to knowledge. Because think about it, you wrote an article in 1992. Now it may have been original and interesting in 1992, but it's 2018 now. So how are you going to make that case? So again, originality in the PhD by prior publication means slightly different things than in a traditional PhD. Particularly, the case has to be made about this is where knowledge was at this point and this is how, through these publications, I've developed knowledge and created originality. Okay, so the candidate is telling the story of the original contribution to knowledge and that's really tricky. I always compare the contextual statement to the exegesis in the creative-led PhD, which is why I put sort of the two vlogs together, really. Because the contextual statement and the exegesis are what I call bonsai theses. They must do the same things that the traditional PhD does in 100,000 words, but in a lot less space. So this is the bonsai PhD. With the PhD by prior publication, the trick and the challenge is to take these disparate parts and through the contextual statement render them together and render them an interesting cluster. Now that's hard. It's hard to bring them together. It's even harder to prove originality once they are together. Tip for punters. Please remember the publications do not speak for themselves. I cannot tell you how many students and supervisors I've had in my office in the last 20 years, wherever those offices have been, and they've come and gone, oh, look, the publications speak for themselves. Dude, dude, 
The publications do not speak for themselves. The publications are publications. This is a PhD. Remembering that refereeing is not examination. Two different things. I know, I think I said that earlier in a vlog, and Randall said that was a major moment for him because he suddenly realised, oh, well, it's gone through refereeing, but examination is different. So that is a key moment, I think, to recognise in the PhD by prior publication. So the mistakes made in this, in this mode of doctorate are when students simply assume the publications speak for themselves, and they don't. We all produce hundreds of refereed articles through our career, but only one PhD. So you have to demonstrate, you have to prove originality, and don't assume that refereeing means terribly much at this point. It is a benchmark, it is something you've got over, and now that you've got over that benchmark, you've got to confirm what is going on here. So the thesis will pass and fail on the contextual statement, just like the creative-led PhDs will pass or fail on the basis of the exegesis. They are the mediator, the filter, or the funnel. Whatever metaphor works for you, think about the exegesis, think about the contextual statement as a way to channel or frame what your publications are about. So tell me the story of the research as overtly and as clearly as you can. What was the context for each of these pieces? How did they develop? What was your research contribution in each of them? And how did one develop into the other? Talk overtly about each piece. piece. Use citations if you can. How the work's been used. Think about impact. Think about significance. Now those two words, impact, significance, incredibly ambiguous and they mean radically different things in different disciplines and interdisciplinary permutations. So go with your interdisciplinary and disciplinary permutations for impact and significance. Make the case. Prove it to me. Now this will vary enormously between disciplines and that's absolutely cool. The key mistake that's made in this mode of doctorate and I see it sadly all the time so this is the nightmare, okay? This is the nightmare which we see. Students throw together some publications. So here's some stuff. Boom, thanks for playing. Excellent. And I'm not making this up. The contextual statement is a series of bullet points about where the publication was published and stuff and when. Right, great. And that's it. And needless to say, that is the way you fail a PhD by prior publication. And can I say, in the PhD by prior publication, they tend to cluster, like the creative-led thesis in many ways, to the top end or the bottom end. Either people go, this is an outstanding case, great case has been made, great body of work, great contextual statement, A, thanks for playing, boom. Or, there's just not enough here. This is an MPhil or lower. So, this is an important tip. My final few comments today from this truly bizarre hotel room uh, about the PhD by prior publication are what is considered a publication. Like, let's think about it, what actually is a publication? Firstly, the, the work must be published. So unpublished work is not part of this party. Okay, but in terms of published work, this is really significant. Through the history of the PhD by prior publication, the focus has been overwhelmingly on refereed articles. But all sorts of things can go in here. Scholarly monographs, refereed articles, yes. Book chapters, conference proceedings, very, very important for computer science and engineering. So, you know, I really hope we get PhD by prior publication from computer science and engineering. And of course, that happens through conference proceedings, but also exhibitions, films, sonic artefacts, born digital objects. So all these variables can become part of the body of work. Much more diverse than we think about. Now, what is frequently shunned in this mode, what is not part of it are, and this is so challenging for medicine and our allied health professions, I apologize for that, but review articles are often excluded. And I'm aware of the challenge of that. Newspaper articles, articles in non-refereed professional journals. Now that's quite significant, of course, for education and again, health. So articles, non-refereed professional publications, not really part of this story. The interesting one is work that has been successfully or unsuccessfully submitted 
to another degree. I'll just give you what, one example of what this means. And I had a student approach me about this when I was in a leadership role at another university in doctoral education. They had attempted to submit a tr traditional PhD uh, and something had gone wrong. Either it had failed or it had you know, not got through the final hurdle, the supervisors had booked, something weird had occurred there. And the candidate had been using that traditional thesis to get published articles to then go again in a PhD by prior publication and, and was refused entry. That's the only one I've heard of this, but it does happen. The other variable that you ca work you can't submit is work on which you were an editor, not an author. So as you can pick up, I think, the presentation of this mode of PhD is absolutely crucial. In all doctorates, I think, PhD students underestimate the importance of presentation. Look, if it's messy, if it's ill-ordered, if it's error-ridden, then, then examiners just go, look, dude, what am I reading here? If there are errors in form, then of course, obviously, the pennies drop and we go, well, there's probably errors in content as well. So for the PhD by prior publication, the presentation is everything. Make sure that the publications themselves, that body of work, that it's gleaming, rationally ordered. And remember, that doesn't mean chronological. Often it's chronological, absolutely. But remember, journals differ. You can put an article out there for refereeing and it takes two years. So it may be out of order before or after other refereed research. So make sure it's ordered in a way that makes sense in terms of content that may actually not be chronological. That's probably important too. And also ensure that your contextual statement is beautifully written. I need this to be evocative and powerful. It needs to convey your research ability, why you matter, why this work matters. Then nail the original contribution to knowledge. Be overt, be clear, don't take any prisoners. What is your original contribution to knowledge? Prove it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you pass a PhD by prior publication. You're enrolled between six months and 12 months. And if you're clear on what's required, like hopefully what I've done today, on what's necessary through that mode of enrolment, quick and successful. So thank you so much to Randall for this incredible suggestion. You are a great human being and I feel so lucky that I've had a chance to meet you and that you have chosen Flinders to do this amazing research that you're doing. So my respects, good sir, and I hope I've delivered for you and delivered on your request. So from this truly weird hotel room in the Lake District, I wish you love, light, and peace. Tia. <laughs>